The Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. I'm Amber Bell, and this is Real Agriculture. Here today with Dana Riley, who is a tech service specialist with BASF. We're going to be doing a canola school, talking about establishing seed survival, which is really important because we want our canola coming out of the ground as fast and strong as possible. So welcome, Dana. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so we're talking about seed survival. Let's just dive right into it here. What are some of the early season factors that are going to affect seed treatment efficacy? Yeah, so canola is one of those plants that when you get it established, it it, it will grow like a weed and it, it is a strong weed in, in the Western Canadian landscape. But making getting it out of that seedling stage can be really difficult. So there's a few things. Um, one of the biggest things when we look at seed treatment and what it bolsters would be those early um, early season diseases like seaborne blackleg, uh, alternaria, seedling disease complex, which we have a short memory. We've kind of forgotten about some of those things being that it's been so dry. Obviously, nobody's forgotten about blackleg, but seedling disease complex is kind of a thing of the past lately. Um, but yeah, all of those uh, early season diseases are protected by your base seed treatment. So it's really important that we are seeding the canola in a state that's going to come out of the ground as fast as possible. And the reason for that is because we want the seed treatment to last in the crop. Um, and if your seed is sitting in dry soil or too wet of soil or cold soil, really, um, it's going to delay emergence. And then you're not going to get as good of a bang for your buck on seed treatment as you would if it's popping out of the ground in five days. So that's kind of something to consider is that uh, delayed emergence is probably your worst enemy when it comes to uh, seed treatment staying in the plant for long. Right. So let's talk about that dry or wet soil because mm -hmm. soil moisture is a really big thing. How important yeah. is that to be monitoring that when you're going to plant? When it comes to too wet of soil, uh, if it's a saturated soil, it's going to restrict oxygen movement, um, which is going to kind of mess up your root development. Um, so this is something, you know, you can't control, but maybe you choose a really just to skim the canola in. If it's really, really wet, give it its be the best chance as possible. There's other factors that might happen when it's really wet, like you seed in wet conditions and then you get a soil crust or you get a heavy rain with a soil crust that can be really hard on canola. Uh, it's just, you know, just a, a, just the nature of canola is quite small seedlings. So they can't break through the crust, like something like wheat could in conditions when you don't have enough moisture in your seed bed, uh, you're really looking at an uneven germination, but this is something to not totally panic about. Um, eventually fingers crossed eventually it will rain um and you want to make sure that your seed depth is on point so between that 0.75 inches to 1.25 inches you don't want to go chasing moisture um past that 1.25 inches because it can really impact your um plants per square foot or your target seed rate um so in those dry conditions i know it's hard not to, to panic but just keep it at the adequate uh, depth. Eventually it's going to rain. It's going to fill in. Just something to keep in mind. Um, another thing with dry conditions, you know, sandblasting when it, in the wind can be really damaging to a canola seedling. There's not a lot we can do about it, unfortunately, but it's just something to keep in mind when, when you have those questions of like, hmm, what happened this year? What, what happened to my canola? You know, that, that can be a factor. And let's kind of change direction a little bit and talk mm. about fertilizer toxicity. Mm, what impact yeah. does that have on seed survival? Yes. So um, I'd say that fertilizer toxicity uh, probably occurs in more dry soils. It can happen in wet soil conditions, but if you have lots of rain in the forecast, I wouldn't worry as much about it. Uh, the government of Saskatchewan has some really great charts now, this, this information was done in the 90s for all of the seed toxicity um, 
information. Uh, so you take, <laughs> take it with a grain of salt, pun intended. Uh, and you really just need to know what's best on your for your operation. So are you using a mid row? Are you having a um, side band? Did you spread your fertilizer beforehand? If we if we go off the provincial guidelines, we don't want to go more than 10 pounds of nitrogen uh, actual seed placed. But I would challenge everybody to do a little bit of reading because uh, Borgo up in northern Saskatchewan, I think it's Curtis de Goyers, the agronomist, and they've done some really interesting studies on seed toxicity where they're pushing limits. They're losing a lot of seeds per square foot, but they're not losing yield. So if you like, if you like doing trials on your own farm, you know, play around with it, do your seed counts and compare it to your uh, plants per square foot that you targeted and see what your fertilizer mortality rate could possibly be. I know that's a bit of a bit of an off kilter answer, but it's good to sometimes push the envelope. If you're doing something like that, what impact does that have on weeds coming up then? Mm, you know what? Um, I don't think that it's going to push weeds up more than the average fertilizer. Uh, I think that that's a great segue into critical weed free period. Um, anytime we have weeds at the same stage as our crop where you have a competing, something competing for a source, whether that source is of moisture, nutrients, real estate, whatever it might be. Um, so if you're fertilizing really heavy and you have a bunch of weeds that you didn't take care of at your pre-burn, you're probably going to bolster the weed population rather than your crop population. If you've taken care of those weeds before seeding, um, you'll have, you'll give that crop time to establish and outcompete some of the weeds there until you can get in for in-crop, of course. So yeah. Which is super important. And important. we can't really talk about weeds without also talking about pests let's talk yes. about bugs um, I, I learned last year that aphids mm. are like Perfect. russian dolls yes and have three generations within one each mm. one so that's that's you know talk to me about pests and what I, impact yeah. do insects and bugs have on seed survival so pests for canola kind of endless uh Flea beetles, I think everybody battles with flea beetles, cutworms. Um, gophers are a really hot topic in the last few years. We've been in a dry cycle and people are having to deal with gophers. Those would kind of be the three beginning pests. There's Canola has a bunch of other pests later in the year, but I think uh, with, with that critical weed-free period, you got to be thinking about, you know, did I use an appropriate seed treatment for my area? So if you know you're on a short canola rotation, you're in a wooded tree area, or you have, you know, a bunch of grass ditches pasture, you're probably going to be battling with flea beetles. So um, you need to check your fields, check, check, check. That's the best thing you can do. Look for damage, um, look for stem feeding, all that good stuff. And then when it comes time where we've seen that 20, 25% defoliation or feeding on the stem from flea beetles, it's time to go in with an insecticide to prevent any economic damage. Um, I've, in my experience, I've never regretted throwing my in-crop in at this point. I've never regretted spraying early. I have always regretted spraying late though. So, you know, if you're at one leaf canola and you're spraying for flea beetles, you might as well throw in um, your uh, glufosinate to, uh, take care of any of the weeds there and then you're done. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to cutworms, again, you just got to keep checking. You got to have somebody out on a quad uh, looking for bare spots and digging around. And once you start to see bare spots the size of a pickup truck, you should have alarm bells ringing. If they're the size of a combine, it's probably time to load up the sprayer. Um, and then for gophers... <laughs> Best way to get rid of gophers is really early in the spring. So if you have gophers and you're not out there dealing with them now, you got to get on them before they start having babies. So um, I know uh, the Sask RMs have a program in place to put up um, like hawk towers, nests. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe help with some of the costs associated. So reach out to your local RM. But this is a critical time for canola. One to four leaf is when we baby it. And after that, you just kind of let it do its thing. Yeah, <laughs> push it out of the nest and it it, uh, it will become a beautiful crop. Great. And then before I let you go here, let's talk about seeding depth really quickly and mm-hmm. how important that is. Yes, I touched on it a little bit, but I will remind everyone 0.75 inches to 1.25 inches is going to give you the best start for emergence. Anything deeper than that, uh, that uh, cotyledon just has a really hard time pushing out of the soil um, and it it can uh, it can damage yield in at the end of the day because you're losing plants per square foot. If you're going shallower than that, really the only appropriate time is if you're somewhere in like the Red River Valley of Manitoba and you're just like swamped with water all the time. Uh, some guys will just skim it in. Um, but when it comes to water absorption, think of it, you know, you've dropped your cell phone in the kitchen sink and you need to put it in a bowl of rice. Seeds are the same. You just need to... Uh, you need to put it in enough moisture that it's going to absorb a little bit of water. So if it's stuck in that moisture just a bit, you're golden. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Dana. And that was Dana Riley on Real Agriculture. 